Hi, welcome back to My Smart Learning. This is a lesson for Year 12s. As promised from yesterday, we looked at transpiration and factors affecting transpiration. Today we're looking at translocation. So this is for A-level biology. Uh, if you guys are watching and you're doing GCSEs or in Key Stage 3, Year 7, 8 or 9 or 10 or 11, you don't need to watch this. Uh, anyone that's interested in A-level biology, then this would be useful. Um, so I'd like to start My Smart Learning. Um, this is a joke for Joe, because Joe likes to always start off lessons with a joke. Um, but we'll ask Alexa if she's got any jokes today. Alexa, what's the joke of the day? Why did the chicken cross the road? Don't know. That's really only the chicken's business. How rude. So, without further ado, what we're looking at today is translocation. So we've looked at transpiration, don't get confused between transpiration and translocation. Transpiration is the movement of water. Translocation is the movement of sugars. So it's looking at how sugars move throughout a plant and the evidence for that. So our objective, how does sugar move around a plant or plants? Quick recall, high five quiz. You all know the score, you all know the drill. Um, one to five, answer these questions, pause the video, check them at the end, and if you get them right, you get a virtual high five from me. Completely sanitized hands. So, number one, uh, water enters the roots via what mechanism? So that's question one, water enters the roots by what mechanism? We did that yesterday. Question two, what are the two pathways that water can go through the cortex? So once it's gone through the epidermis, the root hair cells, what are the two pathways? Question three, um, what is the theory of how water moves up the stem and into the leaves? So what is the theory? What do we call it? Question four, give us four factors that affect the rate of transpiration. Four factors and how they affect the rate of transpiration. And question five, how does a potometer work? How does a potometer work? You, this won't be for one word answer, so it should take at least two or three minutes. So if you wanna pause the video, check your answers, and I'll go through the answers now. So water enters the roots via osmosis. So osmosis is the passive movement passive movement of water from a high water potential to a low water potential. So in the soil it's a high water potential, in the roots it's lower, so water enters the roots via that mechanism. But what causes that mechanism to, to, to allow to have a low to high water potential gradient is the active transport of mineral ions that go into the root hair cells. Question two, the two, two pathways then, once it's in the cortex, it's the apoplastic pathway, which is also known as the cell wall pathway, and you've got the symplastic pathway, which is also known as the cytoplasmic pathway. Um, question three, the theory of how water moves up the stem is known as the cohesion tension theory. The cohesion tension theory. If you're not sure what that means, go back and have a look at the uh, previous two videos, and that goes into quite a lot of detail. Question four, uh, four factors that affect transpiration. The one that does the opposite is humidity. So humidity, if the humidity is lower, the transpiration will be higher and vice versa. If the, transpir if the humidity is greater, the transpiration will be lower. The other three though, if you increase the other three, it increases transpiration. And the other three factors were light, because the more light, more photosynthesis, stomata are open, faster transpiration. The next one was temperature. The higher the temperature, the uh, the greater the kinetic energy of the water molecules, therefore you're going to get a faster rate of diffusion. So increased temperature increases rate of transpiration. And the last one was the wind speed. So the greater the air movement, the faster the wind speed. It blows that water away. It maintains a greater gradient, pressure gradient, and the water uh, potential gradient, and therefore faster rate of transpiration. Question five, the last one. How does a potometer work? Remember, a potometer is a, it's basically a very, very thin tube of water and you have a continuous column of water with a plant at the top. You make sure it's completely airtight. So you have a continuous column of water through, through the plant and through the capillary tube. You have a graduated scale, i.e. a ruler along where the end of the water column is or you have a, a bubble uh, set up on it. Uh, you 
change the um, you change the uh, factors outside, for instance, light or air movement or temperature or moisture, and you time how long it takes for the bubble to move along. Okay, so that's what you're measuring, the rate of water uptake through the plant. So that's how a photometer works. What we're focusing on today is translocation. So what do I mean by translocation? Well, translocation is the movement of sugar. So it's sucrose. How does sucrose and sugars move through the plant? Now, remember water is being drawn up the xylem under negative pressure. So the trunk gets squeezed in of a, of a tree because it's been pulled up. So there's a sucking in effect. So it's po uh, negative pressure. Whereas the sucrose is moving in an opposite way. It's moving in what we call positive pressure. So it's being pushed, pushed. So with sucrose though, it can either move up the plant or down the plant. Whereas with water movement, that continuous column of water, it only moves up the plant. So up the xylem, whereas sucrose can move up and down and it travels through the phloem. Now, one of the um, uh, bits of evidence for this is, for instance, a maple syrup. What is maple syrup? Well, it comes from the maple tree. So if I literally went up to a maple tree and hammered in a little tube into um, directly into the phloem, you can see maple syrup literally oozing out. And the same thing for rubber plants. If you look at a rubber tree, Okay, yes, it's true. Rubber comes from rubber plants, a rubber tree, not a tree made from rubber. It's an actual tree where you'd literally, if you hammered into the phloem, into the stem, it would ooze out this white sap, which is a sticky white sap, and that's rubber. And what we do is we just condense it, take the moisture out of it, and you've got rubber. Um, so here's a closer up picture of that. So you literally tap into these maple trees and out oozes out maple syrup. Brilliant for your pancakes or your waffles, whichever one you fancy. So what does it look like? So phloem is the important bits here. The phloem, uh, we looked at the xylem and the structure of xylem with the lignin and the sort of hexagonal rings that keep it as like a hollow wooden tube. The phloem though, if I look at a longitudinal section through a stem, and I look at the phloem, so longitudinal means it's this way, and I cut, if that's the stem and I cut that way along it, that's the longitudinal section. What you see, is these this is a um, sieve tube element okay so this is this whole structure is a sieve tube element what we've got these are the sieve tubes and at the top of these sieve tubes you've got these sieve plates and these sieve plates you know what a sieve is it's got tiny tiny holes in it and that's what these sieve plates do they have little tiny holes in them and scientists are not exactly sure what the purpose of them are but possibly the fact that they sort of hold the thing open so it doesn't collapse Although it is under positive pressure because the sugars have been moved, so it would push outwards. And on the end of the, on the side of these uh, sieve tube elements, you've got um, uh, these companion cells. Now, what's a companion? Companion is like a friend, someone who walks beside you. So here, these cells are beside the sieve tube elements, and these companion cells are very, very important to get the sucrose into these sieve tube elements. If I cut across though, so it's a transverse section, if I cut through them this way, you can see that's the lumen, these are cell walls, here's my sieve plate again, okay, you can see there's tiny holes in there, scientists are not sure what they're there for, possibly to keep them open or sort of a filtration system because there are holes in them so certain things can pass through and other things won't be. Here's my companion cell and here's my sieve tube elements there next to my companion cells. So that's what it looks like there. How are these distributed? So if I look, if I do a cross section, and this is something that uh, from a previous lesson, if I look at the root and I do a cross section through a root, okay, so a transverse section through a root, remember you've got the epidermis on the outer of it, these are your root hair cells. This pinkish bit here is the cortex, where you get the apoplastic and symplastic pathway. Here you've got the endodermis, which is the inner layer. And within the endodermis, when we've got little Casperian strips in there, within the endodermis, this little X shape here, or this little star shape here, is your xylem vessels. The phloem are sort of dotted around the xylem. So that's what it looks like when you cut through a root. Okay? Whereas if I cut through a stem, okay, so literally the stem's going up, if I cut through a stem, you can see it's a different organization, different arrangement. So you've got your xylem sitting here on the inner bit, okay, and then you've got your phloem tissue sitting in these pipes 
on the outer section. That's why if you tap into them, you can see that uh, the uh, sucrose comes pouring out. And one of the evidence for this is that aphids, why is it a positive pressure, which I'm going to come on to later looking at the evidence, why is it positive pressure? Well, when an insect comes and lands on the stem of a thin like flower or, or plant, the aphid has got a little needle that sticks out of its mouth. And as it pierces into the phloem, if it was under negative pressure, the phloem would be moving away from it. So it'd have to suck the uh, sucrose into its mouth. But it's not doing that. It literally just points its uh, needle into it, into its mouth, and sucrose just goes into its stomach. So it's filling up, okay? So it's literally, it's like you open your mouth and somebody pouring sugar syrup straight into your stomach, into your mouth and into your stomach. It's, it's pouring in like through a hose pipe. So that's what's happening there. That's one piece of evidence to show you that it's positive pressure because there's no mechanical movement in the in the aphid or these little insects where they're like chewing it or trying to suck it on it. It's just basically uh, being pushed into its mouth. So what does it look like then? So um, or what is the mechanism? So this is the fundamental bit of this translocation. So this is the bit you need to be able to explain and describe or describe and explain how the sucrose is being moved up or down um, the plant. Now we're going to come back to this notion of sources and sinks, but a source is where the sucrose is being made and the sink is where the sucrose is going to go to, the sugar is going to go to. Now the most obvious places are the leaf, so if, let's say the top of my plant is the leaf here and down, down, down below is going to be my, my roots, my, my roots are going to swell up with, with the sucrose or the, um, the glucose and that will turn into starch eventually like potatoes or carrots and things like that. So the source is where the photosynthesis is happening and the sugar is being made and the sink is where the sugar is going to and being used either to store it or to use it for things like respiration or for making other structures like oils and things like that for in seeds or cellulose for cell walls. So but what is the mechanism? So this is the bit you really must get your head around. So what, what do we have going on? Well, you've got the sucrose being made, the sugar being made by photosynthesis in the chloroplasts. Then it needs to move into the companion cell. Now the first bit on this bit here, the sucrose moves from a high concentration to a low concentration into the companion cell. So this bit here is a straightforward facilitated diffusion. It moves from a high concentration to a low concentration. So that's straightforward. You've got these special channel proteins there that um, uh, these proteins that will allow facilitated diffusion from a high concentration where the glucose is constantly being made by photosynthesis and moves into the companion cell. That bit straightforward. Now here's the tricky bit. This is the bit that people don't get their head around and get confused about. This bit here, this is my sieve tube element. The sucrose has to go from here, the companion cell, into the sieve tube element. This is not a straightforward, let's just diffuse from a high to a low concentration. Okay, this bit here requires active transport. So what you've got is you will have ATP, active transport of hydrogen ions from this companion cell going into the spaces in the cell wall structure of the companion cell and that sieve tube element. So that little wall space there, that purple little strip there, is where hydrogen ions are being pumped against the concentration gradient, so from low to high concentration, into that uh, space in the walls of the of the cell walls. That's the hydrogen ions. So once it gets into there, the sucrose now, because it doesn't just naturally just diffuse across. Once that hydrogen ion is in there, in this wall here, you've got co-transporters. Now you come across co-transporters before when we looked at how glucose uh, lower down the intestines, the small intestines, when you get lower and further, further down the ileum where absorption occurs, we've looked at the um, transport of sucrose or, or the sugars, the glucose, with sodium ions by a co-transport. Here it's the same kind of mechanism, but it's not sodium ions here, it's hydrogen ions. The co-transporter, this particular protein, okay, this co-transporter protein, will take the hydrogen ions and the sucrose together and they'll go from the companion cell, from a high to low concentration here, uh, into the sieve tube element. So now my sucrose is in the phloem, but how do I get that sucrose to move? Okay, because it's not osmosis 
and it's not going to just move by diffusion it's not going to just move along okay so I need to somehow push that sucrose to the position I wanted to get to either up the plant or down the plant so I need to put some kind of uh, positive pressure on there some kind of push so how, how does that happen well that happens because of water so if you notice there's water moving up the xylem so here's the xylem vessel water is moving up the xylem okay as it does as it goes up to the leaves and as water moves up the xylem what happens is water has got a, a high water potential here but a very low water potential in the phloem because there's lots and lots of sucrose in there lots of sugar so very sweet sticky sugar low water potential high water potential well what does water do when there's a water potential gradient water by osmosis will always move from a high water potential to a low water potential so that's what happens here so you've got you've got the water being moved from a high water potential to a low water potential down a poten water potential gradient and that causes because you've got the buildup of traffic now you've got not just the sucrose there you've got now water flooding in that causes the pressure to build up and that pressure forces the sugar either down or up depending on where it wants to go and it'll go for this situation it goes down so the water comes in and it produces a high hydrostatic pressure we come across that word before when we looked at ultrafiltration in the um when we talked about the uh what was it what did we look at we looked at the oh memory slips me now when we looked at the filtration of tissue fluid that was it tissue fluid a few lessons back we talked about ultrafiltration because of the high hydrostatic pressure of the um in the blood because the heart is pumping remember and it's pushing the blood uh, outwards in the arterial end it's going to have high hydrostatic pressure on that side and via ultrafiltration i forgot to mention that word i can remember after i taught that lesson on, on youtube the last time it's ultrafiltration you gain filtration of that water uh, being forced and pushed through those tiny holes because remember natural filtration happens because of um, gravity pulling water down but ultrafiltration you're putting force against it it's hydrostatic pressure so here high hydrostatic pressure now is building up in there because the water is moving in by osmosis and that forces the sucrose down 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 now as it goes down it gets to a point where the sucrose here will move by diffusion into this companion cell because this companion cell has a low sucrose concentration because there's no photosynthesis going on here so it's got low sugar concentration there so the sucrose will diffuse from a high concentration to a low concentration into this companion cell now if the sucrose moves in that way that means the concentration there is now decreasing and the water potential now in here is increasing because you're losing that sugar so that water then will move from a high water potential to a lower water potential area so some of it actually goes back into the xylem so it carries on with that water so you've got this little circular effect there so some of that goes over there but some of it follows the sucrose in to the companion cell so water will move in there as well so again you're going to get this high concentration of sugar there there's only one way it can go it's not going to go that way it has to go that way because of the particular protein channels there so sucrose will diffuse by facilitated diffusion into the companion cell and then because of the cell that's using it the sink either by storing it by turning it into starch like in the potato or that cell needs the sucrose for energy for aerobic respiration then what will happen is the sucrose here the concentration is going lower and lower and lower because it's being used and used and used therefore very low concentration a higher concentration there it will diffuse by facilitated diffusion into the uh, cell that's using it either for respiration or for storage okay in our sink so that is the mechanism that is the the fundamental idea in today's lesson so you need to be able to look at the diagram and explain describe and explain what is going on in these sequence of events okay if you missed anything pause it rewind it listen back to different sections again and again because it is quite a difficult concept to get through and there's lots of things happening around uh, this so what do i mean by sources and sinks so a source it's where it's made the glucose is made it's the photosynthesizing part of the plant and the sink is where it's going to where it's either being stored or used 
Okay, so what kind of uses have we got? So here we go, we've got um, the, uh, the leaves there are the source, and here is the sink in the roots there where it's storing it. Some of it's gonna be stored in the stems as well because it's gonna become uh, turned into cellulose to become part of this, uh, this stem and also in the, in the roots as well. So, and also the cells need the sucrose for growth, for repair, for you know, aerobic respiration, they turn into oils like in seeds and nuts and things like that. And also they will use it for flowering and they will also use it for, um, I'm sure this one out, uh, yeah, seeds, oils and things like that. So uh, cellulose, that was the one, cellulose for cell walls. Okay, so these are all sinks. So the leaves are, are woody as well, are woody plants, which you call uh, the herbaceous plants. These are sort of deciduous plants there. They lose their leaves in autumn. They're going to lose their leaves. So different part, times of the year as well. Uh, this will, you know, all summer will be the source. But then eventually when it starts to run out of glucose, it's not making as much. These might become sinks eventually, okay, depending on the time of year. So it's not as straightforward. The little berries and the seeds and the nuts and things like that will become uh, sinks as well. Um, during when it's summer and they're making all that sucrose from photosynthesis, all that sugar that's being made, or the sources, during the summer and the spring, and the, the seeds and the nuts where they're getting used and stored, and in the roots and stone, they're the sinks. But then in the winter, the opposite happens, in the autumn, the leaves are starting to fall off, these guys suddenly start to need energy. So now the sucrose needs to go from these berries and these nuts and these uh, stored vegetables, like the potatoes and carrots and so on. And the, um, the sucrose has to go the opposite direction from now what these guys are now, technically the sources, and then they need to go to the leaves, which will now be the sinks. Okay, so it depends on the, the, the time of the year. So we've got flowers, which can be sinks. We've got these berries, which can be sinks, and these little berries here. That could be sinks too. So herbaceous plants are like woody, woody plants. And we've got our fruits as well. So as I said, it can change depending on the time of the year. So I'm going to post this on Show My Homework. So make sure you make your notes from the Caboodle textbook um, and answer the questions from uh, the Caboodle textbook. It's going to be two sections today. I'm doubling up two lessons. I'm putting them into one. Uh, on all of the bit about translocation. So the first section was just purely on um, the mechanism of translocation. The second half of that, uh, or second lesson, so to speak, is actually about evidence. How do we get the evidence to say, well, that is how we know it's positive pressure and it's moving up or down. I'm gonna post this on show my homework so you've got the notes to make, but use your Caboodle textbook and answer the questions, make your notes, and uh, make sure you read through uh, all of the slides uh, that I've been talking you through. So again, we've got beetroots as well, so the roots will become swollen roots, and these guys are your sinks, and then eventually in the winter they will become, or in the autumn will become your uh, sources. So, we will move on to the evidence then. So we've got our plants, let's go whiz through this, stuff for you guys to read right so how can i m work out or what kind of evidence can i get to show where the sucrose is moving and how do i know it's getting to that that bit so we're looking at investigations how do i investigate uh, translocation and how do i know it's in the phloem and not in the xylem and how do i know that that sugar was made there and it's got over there because i can't follow the sugar so to make sure you can follow the sugar you're going to make sure you have got to use radioactive carbon dioxide. You have to use a radioisotope. Now, if you think back to your GCSC chemistry or your A-level chemistry that you're doing now, an isotope is where you've got a different version of the same element. So for instance, in the universe, carbon exists as carbon 12, because remember it's got six and a 12. Six being the atomic number, it's got six protons. The 12 is the relative atomic mass. So you've got 12, so it's going to be 12 take away six. You could have six protons and six neutrons. However, carbon doesn't always exist in that form. There is a carbon-14 that also exists out there, an isotope version. So if the mass number, the relative atomic mass is 14 now, that means it's still got six protons, but now it's got 14 take away six, which has got now eight neutrons. It's a heavier version of carbon. However, 
it's a radioisotope. It's one that disintegrates, which means that you can use auto radiography, which basically means you can use films that basically ex get exposed by that radiation and it causes a discoloration, just like how an x-ray film works. So, you know, when you got your broken bones, I hope you haven't got any broken bones, but you know what I mean, and looking through your bags in a, in an airport, an x-ray goes straight through. The denser bits it won't go through and the other bits it will and it'll expose the film. So you get white shadows and, and the black bits. Same thing here, you you can expose film to see where has that carbon got to. Now remember glucose, the formula for glucose is C6H12O6, it's carbon. So if you use radioactive carbon dioxide in a bag and you surround your plant in a bag and you sort of tie it up, so in there you only eject radioactive carbon dioxide, well that carbon dioxide is going to diffuse through the stomata and into the leaves. And the plant will turn that carbon dioxide now into glucose. But now you can follow where that glucose is going because it's going to have radioactive carbon dioxide making the radioactive sugar now. And now you can follow it. And um, that's why we use this radioisotope to do that. Now, what do we call it? We call this mass flow theory. Now, the mass flow theory is, is some evidence to show um, that this is under positive pressure and it's being pushed by hydrostatic pressure. Now, this is a model to help us uh, explain and describe this mass flow theory. So it's not perfect because um, it's not going to show it perfectly because and I'll explain why in a second. But if we start off by how this works. So if you imagine A is my source and B is my sink. So the sucrose or the sugar there is at a high concentration in my leaf. Now here it's in a, these guys are semi-permeable membranes and you've got a tube connecting these two little spheres here. So semi-permeable, so that means water can go in and out of them, but the sugar can't. It's a semi-permeable membrane, just like how we do osmosis, right? So in A, it's very, very dark yellow there, very sugary, high concentration, which means it's got very low water potential there. Outside the water, obviously, is going to be very high water potential. So which way will the water move? Well, obviously, the water is going to move into A because it goes from a high water potential to a low water potential. But if you've only got so much space in there, though, so because it's got a certain volume, it's not going to expand. So if you've got more water particles in there, if you've got more water molecules in a given space, that means the pressure will start to increase. And that's causing high hydrostatic pressure. If you've got high hydrostatic pressure, you're going to force that sucrose there up this pipe and the sucrose is going to move along this tube or this pipe and move into B. Now, if this area, if it's more dilute still in B compared to the outside here, and this has got a high hydrostatic pressure compared to the osmotic potential, the water will be forced out from B into the surrounding solution. The sugar stays where it is because the sugar can't move out because it's semi-permeable. So what's going to eventually happen is eventually all of this is going to end up going up there until it gets to there. So it's being pushed along there. It's under hydrostatic pressure. So this is the evidence or a little model to show us and provide evidence for this mass flow theory. Eventually, what will happen, and then if you, if you get loads of water building up here, because the water's moving out, well, the water's being used up there, so it'll be filling into there. So this water level will start to drop, but then the water goes in there, comes through there, in there, and then gets forced out because of the hydrostatic pressure. That means, because the water levels, because remember you've got the atmosphere around it, this water level can't go down and this one go up. This water will eventually stay balanced, so this water will continually flow that way, so you'll continually keep this level of water. Now, why is this method, uh, uh, model good? Well, it kind of explains what we're talking about when we talked about this mass flow theory. How is it not so good? Well, the disadvantage of this model is this. Eventually, A and B will reach an equilibrium because the amount of sugar there and there will be the same. So if that happens, what will happen to this system? Well, what will happen is if you've got an equilibrium, this system will completely stop. You'll have A and B exactly the same, and everything will just stay as it is. It won't, there won't be no mass flow. 
So that's why this model isn't perfect because it will eventually come to a complete halt because it will reach an equilibrium. So advantages and disadvantages to this or explaining this mass flow. So evidence supporting the mass flow hypothesis. Again, it's a hypothesis, so it's not proof as such, but um, we've got some uh, evidence here. So this is obviously in your uh, PowerPoint I'm going to send to you on your show of homework. What have we got? There is pressure within the sieve tubes, because remember the sap comes out, so evidence for positive pressure. The concentration of the sugar in the leaves is always higher in the leaves than it is in the roots, so that's another piece of evidence. There's a downward flow in the flow and occurs during the daylight. So during the day, flow and the sugar is going down, but in the night, that doesn't happen, it stops moving. So there's another piece of evidence to say, well, photosynthesis, more sugar being made there, it's being pushed down. Nighttime, no sugar is being made. Therefore, the high, there's not a high concentration of leaves. It's no longer going down. It's kind of stopping. So therefore, again, evidence for mass flow. Um, another one, increase in uh, sucrose levels in the leaf followed by a similar increase in sucrose in the flow a little later. Another piece of evidence. If I can use my radioactive isotope, my carbon-14, I can follow it. I can see that, well, look, it's in the leaf. And a little bit later, it's now in the flow. Again, mass flow. Metabolic inhibitors or a lack of oxygen inhibit translocation. Why? Well, think about it. I talked about ATP earlier, didn't I? And the hydrogen ions being transported. If you're using a metabolic inhibitor or a lack of oxygen, which means there's no aerobic respiration, therefore there's no ATP, no ATP, no active transport of hydrogen ions, therefore there's no co transport of that sucrose into the companion cell, sorry, from the companion cell into the phloem. So you're not going to get any of that. Another piece of evidence. Companion cells possess many mitochondria, readily leaf produce ATP, which links back to that one. So that's another piece of evidence. Things that don't support it. So evidence, well, not against it, but evidence like questioning it on the validity of this data. The we're not sure what the sieve plates do, like I was talking about earlier, okay? Because uh, they would hinder the mass flow because they'd have to go through those tiny holes. So that's slowing the whole thing down. Not all solutes move at the same speed. So they should not, uh, so they should do... So if the movement of the mass flow, okay? So there's a question around that. Sucrose is delivered at more or less the same rate to all regions rather than going more quickly to areas of the lowest concentration. Mass flow would suggest that, because remember I said there's a concentration gradient, so therefore it should go quicker to places where they need it more, but it doesn't, it goes at the same speed to everywhere. So that's kind of questioning it. So what kind of investigations can we do to sort of help us support this mass flow theory? Well, we've got this ringing investigation. We talked about the aphid one already. The aphids like stick their needle in there and then they just flowing into them. So that's under a positive pressure. A ringing experiment, what you can do is if you literally take a strip of the bark away from or the outside of the stem there. So you cut just into the phloem because remember the phloem was just on the outer layer and the xylem were in the inner. If we leave the xylem where they are, but we cut the protective layer of the bark off and we cut the phloem away and then you leave it. So we've got this strip there. If it was under negative pressure, what you'd see is nothing. It was just constantly being pulled up, wouldn't it? But you don't see that. What you see is a bulge. The ringing there causes a bulging in this stem here, showing you that the sucrose is moving down. So then that there's a bulging effect going on there. So that's one piece of evidence in the ringing investigation. And the last one then, these traces that we were talking about, these radioactive traces, um, you can add radioactive potassium to water and you can follow where that water is going. And you can add radioactive traces to like the, the carbon dioxide for the sucrose, so you can follow where that sucrose is going as well. So you can follow it by taking auto radiographs. So taking a snapshot, like an X-ray film, and seeing in real time, where is that sucrose? Where is it exposing? What sh shades are you getting there? You know, the black and the white shades. So that's another piece of evidence you can use. This one is uh, showing you, well, Where's the water going from the xylem? Because remember, there's water from the xylem is going into the phloem, causing the high hydrostatic pressure. So let's follow the water instead. And let's not follow the sucrose, let's follow the water. So water will be going up though, because of the transpiration pull. So water will be moving up. And if I add a radioactive isotope to that, for instance, potassium, I can, uh, I can follow that water, see where that water is going. And I can see where the concentration is higher or so. So for instance, as water is moving up, this pink bit here is the xylem, the uh, brown strips on the outer bit is the, the phloem. What you have done here is we've pulled away the phloem very slightly away from the xylem and put a little 
uh, waxy paper in between, which is impermeable. So water can't pass through the, the waxy strips there. Because what should happen, so if I take a measurement here, water will be moving up here. Now what I should get is a high concentration of hydrogen or potassium ions here. Okay. And then what happens though is eventually, because it will move in to the phloem, okay, so it goes across into the phloem, forcing the sugar down. So what I get is a low concentration of potassium here, but I get a high one there. And then eventually here though, the water will not be moving across because it can't, because there's a waxy strip there. So any readings I take from two, three, and four, you'd get a high reading of the potassium in the xylem there, but you'd get a low reading in there, showing that the water hasn't moved across. And then when I go back up to here, what I should see in point sample size, sample number one, that again, the potassium levels, the uh, radioactive uh, tracer there, should be low again in there, and it should be high again in there, showing you it's actually moving across from the xylem into the phloem, causing that high hydrostatic pressure, pushing the sugar in the direction it wants to flow. So that is the end of chapter seven. So we've been working hard this term. Unfortunately, some of the term we've been working from home. But we finished all of chapter six and chapter seven, which should have taken us sort of in towards sort of mid-June. OK, um, but we've got it done. And uh, from mid-June sort of into July, we would have started year 13 work. We would have started on chapter 10 and uh, sorry, 11 and 12, looking at photosynthesis and respiration. And we would have done some field work. We would have gone onto the field and done some quadrat quadrat work to do field investigation and uh, sampling data and what have you. Uh, unfortunately, that's all going to be out. So we're going to have to catch up with that when we come back. Possibly it looks like most likely to be, if, we, if we're lucky, fingers crossed, in the summer term. If not, it'll be back in September. Um, but what I will do, because I finished all my chapters, chapter six and seven, after Easter, because um, this is the last lesson of this week, after Easter, as soon as, as, soon as straight back after Easter, two weeks Easter holiday, I will be doing videos on all of Mrs. Martin's content, which was chapter eight, nine, and 10. I know you're halfway through chapter eight because you've done the meiosis. So it's all the biodiversity stuff. Uh, I'll be producing uh, PowerPoints and um, the videos for that for you to do your learning remotely from home. So that will get us sort of May, June, sometimes sort of into, well, we'll start coming back to sort of end of May, April, April, May. Everything should be done for year 12 work by May, end of May. So um, what I'll do after that, we'll, co we'll cross that bridge when we get there, but I'll probably start the year 13 content. Um, but hopefully this has all been uh, useful for you um, and you've learned the stuff. If there's any questions, if you're not understanding anything, please send comments or questions to the Show My Homework um, website. That's where I'm communicating with students through there. If, if you want to add stuff to the YouTube, you can do. Uh, hopefully, My Smart Learning has been useful for you and you've been learning lots of stuff. And I hope you guys are keeping well and taking care of yourselves and making sure you're washing your hands and staying two meters away from each other and not making unnecessary uh, trips. I hope you guys have a, a decent Easter holiday or being sort of stuck indoors. I hope you're finding this time very useful for you guys to make sure you got all your notes up to date, get all your notes done from your caboodle, make sure you get exam questions done. I know Miss Martin's been posting all the exam questions on Show My Homework. I'll be posting these videos as well as the, the work that you need to be doing. Um, if you've uh, liked it, make sure you click like, watch all the videos again if you need to, like the videos, subscribe to the videos, keep sharing. I know some of you have been with all your friends in other schools as well and other sixth forms uh, around, the, around Birmingham and around the world. Thanks to all of you guys who have been subscribing and watching and liking and sharing. And I hope to see you guys next time. Take care.